Um, so, here we are. The future of Pearl. Here. Is it? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I should just go back a little bit in time and explain you a little bit about the reasoning that I have for doing the things I do. This is a login screen. I hope you can actually see this. Anyway, uh, a login screen of the Plato system from 1973. <coughs> I actually didn't work on the Plato system in 1973. It was only until 1977 that I started working on that system, but, but still. Um, <clears throat> you would type in your name and you type in your password and you'd get online. <coughs> so when I started studying in Amsterdam, well, studying <laughs> uh, in 1977, there was something called the Plato Pilot Project in Amsterdam. It was a project of the university to see whether the Plato system was actually something they could use at the university. What did it do? Well, it was basic, it was really optimized for fun. Um, you, you could chat with people on, on the system, like you have now in IRC channels. It was called Term Talk. You could send and receive email. They were called personal notes. From all over the world, huh? Well, everybody in the world that had access to that mainframe. Uh -huh. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, the mainframe at the University of Illinois, for instance, had about 600 uh, simultaneous users. So, and, and uh, many, many thousands of people that actually had uh, logins on it. Uh, you had news groups reading and writing, which were called group notes. And you had websites. Well, they were basically programs that somebody wrote and that you could run and you could do something with. So what did it have for hardware in those days? It actually had a monochrome graphic screen of 512 by 512 pixels. <coughs> it had a touch panel of 16 by 16 areas. It had an optional back projection of slides with a maximum of 256 slides. It had an optional analog random access audio. <coughs> How did that work? Well, you take a cassette tape, you flatten it, make it a huge disc, mount a head on an arm, and basically start recording and playing back. It's amazing that it worked, <laughs> <laughs> that you could actually do that, and you, the, the machine itself, <coughs> I mean, the noise that it made before you actually heard something like <coughs> clunk, clunk, clunk. Mm, the stepper motors weren't that fine yet in those days, but it worked. And you could actually have a, a fourth voice uh, sound synthesizer attached to this. And this was used heavily for uh, music teaching. So hear training and all, that, all of that shit. Um, <clears throat> so what did it have in community features? Well, you could actually give a comment on any program that you were running and it would actually reco record where that happened in your program and send that comment to the author. Uh, you could actually mark yourself as busy. Like, I don't want to be disturbed. Don't talk to me. Uh, you could actually get help from a person called Term Consult. Uh, people were actually hired by the, uh, the company providing Plato, so people were online to be able to answer questions that you had. You could actually show another person your problem. If you were developing something, you could show them your screen, so they can actually watch what you were doing. These are still features that you don't see that much in, uh, or maybe nowadays you do in, in, uh, on the internet. And you could actually see what other people were typing. And this was called Talkomatic. Actually, if you now go to talkomatic.com, you see a new implementation of that same feature. Everybody's used to RSC, where you can just type things and everybody sees the whole line when it's typed and somebody presses enter. With Turn Talk and Talkomatic, you could actually see people type. This changes your communication quite a bit, I think. <laughs> so, <coughs> What was the online community like? Well, it was really as addictive as the social media are now. I, I started studying physics. They brought this computer to the library in, in the physics building. I spent a few hours on it. I was hooked. There went my study, drop out, forget it. No more physics. 
<coughs> I wrote a, a number of games on it. One called Moria, which is basically a dungeon game. One called Slot, which basically was a four-armed, uh, one-armed bandit. And uh, actually, this was responsible for ruining several projects that were out there in Europe, because people were just playing that game and not using Plato for anything else. <coughs> but yeah, the idea of, of Plato was it's intended for computer-based training. Use the computer to teach people stuff. And uh, my first job that I got was actually create two lessons for French remedial teaching, Le Français Fondamental et Transformation. And basically this was irregular verbs and this was basically idiom teaching. Um, I was supposed to get 400 euros for it, and it took me about six weeks to actually make it, but it was fun. I learned a lot. But in the end, the university could not pay me, because the university can pay a company or hire a person. They cannot pay a person. So I, I very early learned that shit happens when you're developing stuff, and it's not always sure that you actually um, get money for the stuff that you do. But <coughs> I thought actually, well, I made some two nice products and I really liked that. And I knew that French students that would come to the university to study French would actually benefit from this. Uh, too bad the French department decided that the Plato terminals were going to be too expensive and they basically did not use the lesson ever at all. So that was also a lesson for me that <coughs> you may be developing something, but don't be surprised if it just gets flushed down the drain. And so it's more about your travel, your learning yourself, than knowing that what you make is going to be useful and, 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 and accepted by people. <coughs> so in, in 1979, uh, the university started to pay for Plato with students because the students were basically used as developers of courseware. They were got, got about eight euros an hour in current standards, and they would actually pay 16 euros to the temp agency. <laughs> so it goes about 24 hours, it's only for euros an hour for uh, uh, this. They would develop courseware, and it would take generally about 100 hours to develop one hour of courseware. So the university actually paid 2,400 euros per hour, uh, per hour of courseware, and they sold it for about 100k euro per hour. <coughs> but they didn't actually pay that. It's just that the terminals that we got cost 5k euro per month per terminal. So this sort of offset with each other. So the students were actually making sure that we kept Plato in those days. Um, in 1981, the university had to make a decision about uh, whether or not to keep Plato. Um, there was no more pilot project money. I mean, the pilot project had been running for four years, so maybe the pilot should go. And, uh, <coughs> but yeah, the question was, are we going to actually pay 20k euro per terminal for this? And actually, the mainframe of the university needed 8K of RAM to actually make it responsive enough. Uh, the 8K of RAM was several hundred thousand euros. <coughs> With the microcomputers on the horizon and uh, all of that, the university said no, and that was the end of Plato at the university. For me, this was like going deaf and blind all of a sudden, because imagine now, internet not being here. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> right. So <coughs> that was that for me. And in 1983, it basically was the end of Plato. Uh, Console Data, the company that, that marketed it, had really wrong business model. It cost them about $600 to make a terminal and it would sell it at 20K. This is quite a, an uptick. Um, oh, it's Wrong with some odd time. Anyway, it was a very wrong business model. <coughs> and uh, it basically meant the end of console data. Uh, who knows about console data nowadays anymore? I worked there. You worked there? Well, you know a little bit about this. 
Um, and it's really a pity because it, it really it could have been the Minitel of the 80s. If they just had made the terminals a lot cheaper, it would have really made a difference in the game. It, no, so the reason I, I'm bringing this up now uh, and not like two years ago when I did a similar talk about my way uh, to get into Pearl was that uh, actually somebody wrote a book about this. The Friendly Orange Glow. If you're interested in this history, get this book. It, people compare it to uh, the, the soul of a new machine, but then about the Plato system. If you don't know about the soul of a new machine, you should read that as well. Um, <coughs> one of the reviewers said, it's a fascinating tale of missed opportunities and blind spots. Plato lumbered along, ignoring the coming freight train known as the microcomputer revolution that would overtake <coughs> mainframes and leave graphics terminals choking in the dust. It's really, uh, if you read the book, you'll find out that the last remnants of Plato actually lasted to 2009, before somebody actually switched off the final version of the Plato system uh, then. Um, so it went on a long time, but it was basically dead already in the mid 80s. <coughs> now, I hope that we don't, we have a similar situation, I think, with Pearl but I hope we're gonna have a different outcome. Maybe somebody will write a book like this about Pearl in the future, but I hope we will have a different outcome. And if I can help it, uh, it will have a different outcome. And I think you can help as well. Well, anyway, I hope so, that you will. So, <coughs> how do a lot of long-time Pearl users see Pearl? They basically see it a little bit like this. There's Pearl 5 in the center, and we have all these other things that sort of rotate around it. That's like CPAN, that's uh, Pearl Foundation. Uh, there's a butterfly there, but yeah. And I think this is a little bit of a geocentric view. Uh, there's only one Pearl, and only Pearl can pass Pearl, the language. Any other thing called Pearl should get another name. And uh, CPAN is for Pearl code only. I think we need to go more to a Copernican view, where Pearl 5 is just one of the instances of the Pearl 5 mindset, of the Pearl mindset, I should say. Pearl 6 is just another one of them. And uh, <coughs> so are other versions of Pearl, like C Pearl and Perlito and R Pearl. So I, I really, and there could be other Pearl implementations that we don't know about. Strangest things have happened. So I would like to actually see from going from this view to sort of this view. CPAN is actually the most important thing that we have, right? And well, there's a Pearl Foundation still, and we have Pearl 5, and we have Pearl 6. Pearl 6 modules, if, if you are a user, or a, a developer of Pearl 6 modules, you upload them nowadays to CPAN. Most of you won't see that because MetaCPAN doesn't show them. But we have an installer that actually installs the Pearl 6 modules from any CPAN mirror that supports them. And most of them do. So, where are we now? Um, I was thinking of doing the whole video here. I don't know if you know this, but it's David Bowie and, and basically talking about his days in Berlin. <coughs> but there, there's two puppets that are sort of grown together here. And anyway, see the video. <coughs> what I think we have here is, uh, we now have actually has a bag of pearls. Pearl 5 is alive and kicking as usual. Pearl 6 is now running in production. And you will see uh, Jonathan giving two more presentations about how you can use Pearl 6 and what you can do with it. We got CPL running in production, as far as I know. Uh, we, Perlito, which basically converts your Pearl code to Java and then run it on the JVM, is running in production. And our Pearl, still in development, <coughs> but it's getting there. I would say, <coughs> why would you 
convert to something like Perl 6. And then they say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't go about converting Perl 5 code to Perl 6 just because you can. No, you should have a business reason. Uh, Ovid basically pointed that out. Uh, you need a reason to do that. A reason could be that it's fun to do. It's fun to learn. But realize that's the reason you're doing it. I mean, it could be that there's a business reason. Yeah, Ovid basically touched on that. You could have a business reason for having to migrate, reimagine your systems. Maybe that could be Perl 6, who knows? <coughs> yeah, you could be reimagining then doing a direct port. So <coughs> we have originally, when Perl 6 started, something Larry said, well, let's have something that called use v5. And basically it would allow you to support Perl 5 syntax as a slang in Perl 6. This is from the early 2000s, and so slang is like a, a sub-language. So what strange things are these? Well, basically, uh, regular expressions and grammars in Perl 6 are also slangs. You change the language which you're writing your program into something else. And you can do the same for, uh, for a grammar and then basically do Perl 5. But maybe you should go back a little simpler first. Uh, slang toxic. This is a, a slang that was developed for specifically to uh, meet Tuxus Meat, Marijn Brandt, the uh, author of Text CSV. He has very determined ideas about how code should look. And one of the things that he wants is white space between a sub and its arguments. This is very normal for Perl 5. In Perl 6, however, there cannot be a white space between the subname and the parameters because um, the param indicates call what we have before that with these parameters. If there's a space between, <coughs> so since you can also call subroutines in Perl 6 without parameters, so you can say foo a b, it will actually call the subroutine foo with dollar a and dollar b as two parameters. If you say foo parens, so white space parens open parens close, you're actually calling foo with a single argument, which is a list of a and b. Right? And it's this subtle difference uh, that, that basically forces you to say, okay, we don't want to have white space between that. One of the uh, uh, fallouts of this is that you don't need to specify parens in ifs and loops. And whiles, you don't need to put parents around it, you can just forget about them because we know what it is. In Pro 5, you need to for this reason. So, <coughs> slang toxic will actually change the grammar of Perl 6 so that you can say this and mean that. Right? So, you can actually form the language <coughs> to your liking. And this is basically what, I uh, know, oh very important. Uh, there's no runtime penalty for your change because you're just chasing the parser and it <coughs> will still generate the same code, runtime code, opcodes that you would normally do. So when you're running stuff, it doesn't make a difference. Right? It's not like a uh, other solution that you have in that area. So <coughs> maybe come back a little bit to the, a few months ago when I actually uh, posted a uh, NOPA letter to the Perl community. Uh, how many people have read that post? Okay, well, it's less than I hoped. I'm oh, sorry. That's so long ago. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. well, um, <coughs> well it, it upset some people. But I tried to introduce there the CPAN butterfly plan. And what is that? It's basically create pure Perl 6 versions of Perl 5 CPAN modules. So, and this also includes uh, Perl 5 core modules, think LISUtil, and Perl 5 built-in functions, like tie and pack and quote meta. These are all <coughs> commands that we don't know about in Perl, in Perl 6. Well, there's an experimental pack, but that's basically dead. So, don't use that. Um, but it's also about 
simple ones like UCLC, Substr, Ref, to name a few. Why? Because the semantics of these, uh, these built-ins in Perl 5 are subtly different from the ones in Perl 6. In, in Perl 5, if you don't specify a parameter on these, it will assume dollar underscore. In Perl 6, we don't do that. So if you want to have uh, UC, LC, etc., with the Perl 5 semantics, we need something to do that for you. And we can, and I have. So <coughs> this is the progress so far. All of the, well, most of the minus X functions I did call it, well, there's an alphabetical list that basically of the built-ins that I already ported to Perl 6. Uh, most work was uh, basically pack and uh, tie. But uh, if you really want to use tie in Perl 6, now you can. And I did some modules already as well, list utils, square util, blah, 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 blah. All the tie ones uh, related to tie, etc. Why did I do subname? Because this is one of the dependencies of DBIX class. And it's one of the few uh, XS dependencies that we have in, in the DBIX class, DBI being the main other one, but we'll get to that eventually. It's not that many yet, it's a start. Uh, I, I basically did those in the second half of January. And then in February I had a cruise and then I got sick after that and well, whatever. It's, it's been stalling since then, uh, but I intend to pick it up again in the coming uh, weeks. So why would I do this? Somebody pointed out to me that creating a Perl parser for Perl 5 code is relatively easy. Well, relatively, well, I mean, Polito has done it, uh, RPerl is doing it, V5 was doing it, but it stalled because basically there was one guy doing it and we didn't support him enough, is basically what happened. Um, but somebody pointed out that what will kill you are the semantics, right? Parsing something like UC or LC is easy. Making sure that it also takes dollar underscore as a default when you normally don't, that's, what kill, that's what's going to get you in the end. So I see the, the CPIME butterfly pan kind of a prerequisite. A prerequisite for actually doing a, later a butterfly Perl 5 project, which basically would mean the revival of uh, use v5. But there's another reason for me to do this, and it's basically because it actually reduces, when you're coming from Perl 5, it reduces the cognitive change that you need to go through. It makes it easier for you to actually, if you want to do something in Perl 6, and you know that listutil has this some, some, some function that you want to use, well, you can still do use, use listutil, and then it will work for you. And later on, you find out that there's, there's better ways of doing it, and you can later decide to actually do it like that or not. So you get more uh, modules with more familiar and uh, expe expected semantics. Uh, <coughs> if you really want to go implement Getting into implementing this, what I'm doing now for these few models, is actually is quite a good training for you because you're going for something you know, trying to implement something in Perl 6 that you and everybody else will benefit from, and it's a good training. So, because you know what you want. But isn't Perl a dead end technology? I would say no. Uh, Perl 5 is being maintained and optimized. Perl 6 is ready for production. And what I'm working on is, if necessary, migration is going to be easier if you, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, it's going to be easier. Um, but, 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 but access, well, <coughs> if you're using it for internal functions, Perl 6 has introspection. You can introspect just about anything in the system in high-level language constructs. You don't actually need to refer to C to get some internal function that nobody knows about. Case in point, subname. Subname has some access to actually go inside the internals of Perl 5 and find out the name of the, 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 the thing that you're executing. Um, it's basically just uh, saying, okay, this block, give me the name. 
It's just simple as that. Uh, if you're using access for external libraries, in Perl 6 we have native call. A native call allows you to actually specify the interface to an external library by just specifying the signature. This two ints go in, one int comes out. The name of the subroutine in the library is that, and the library is that. It's called that. That's the only thing <coughs> you need to do, nothing else. If you're using access for speed up, I would say don't. Stop doing that. It's a drug. And I'm not the only one saying that because you want pure Perl implementations, if not for go, moving to Perl 6, but also for things like App Fatpacker and, and friends. Talk to Matt Trout about this. He agrees with me on that point. Not many others, but <laughs> he agrees with me on that. So <clears throat> uh, the, the idea is that the runtime should do the optimizations for you. Let the runtime figure out what parts of the code are hot and which parts are not. Don't spend time on things that might be hot. No, let the runtime do this for you. This is one of the things that uh, Jonathan will talk about later, about this afternoon, about how the optimizations can actually help you make things run faster. Go there if you're interested. If you're not interested, go there anyway. <laughs> but, 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 but Perl is tainted. Well, I think it shouldn't be how, about how the world sees Perl. It should be about how we as a community see Perl. Um, so I would say be proud. Wear your Perl badge with pride. Engage in guerrilla marketing. If you see a negative blog post or comment about Perl, react to it in a nice but determined way. Hug the trolls. Really, it's hard, I know. I, 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 I'm not saying I've got a 100% track record, mm -hmm. but I, I, I try. And I think it helps because people think about Perl being dead and everything, and then they find out some stuff. stuff. Uh, case in point, recently there was a, uh, a thing on Hacker News on, uh, I'm not sure what it was anymore. But somebody reacted and say, uh, okay, well, um, I have this um, a prime number algorithm and I ran it a few times a few years ago and it Perl 6 was so slow and and it was like nah, unusable okay well let's check it out hey it is slow why is it slow well <coughs> it turned out the uh, the call to the prime number algorithm routine used uh, a floating point value which in Perl 6 meant all the calculations were doing in, were doing being done in floating points, which doesn't really make sense if you're doing prime number determination. So by just changing the uh, value of the <coughs> that you that you sent to the uh, subroutine, you already made it four times faster. And then, okay, it's doing now ints, which is good, but uh, ints in Perl six are basically big ints in Perl 5. All of our ints in Perl 6 are big ints, so you don't have to worry about values fitting in integer values. It will, automatic, it will automatically size them as you need them. If you really want to have the ints that you use with Perl 5, you should use native ints. Okay. Then I also found a, 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 an error in this uh, algorithm that made things twice as fast, but also for Perl 5. Mm. Uh, <coughs> Yesterday, he actually posted a comment on Stack Overflow where it's now uh, can be seen that actually the Perl 6 version of the algorithm is now about as fast as the Perl 5 version. So this was uh, something that we couldn't think as possible a few years ago, but it is now a fact. So <coughs> we're getting closer on, on speed and everything. But anyway, <coughs> getting back to uh, Perl as a brand. Perl as a brand, basically, is still very strong. There are not many people out there in the world that do not know about Perl. They all have their ideas about Perl. Maybe not very positive, but they all know Perl. Um, so they have the wrong perceptions about it, but we should actually try to bend these perceptions in a positive way. This is not unheard of. I mean, uh, 
I actually am hearing nowadays people that consider switching from macOS to Windows because, well, reasons. <laughs> and this was like unheard of a few years ago. Things can change. Um, <coughs> yeah, you have to keep telling and showing people that Perl has a future because it has. Uh, be it on the Perl runtime, be it on the MorVM runtime, Perl has a future. Or CPRL, or RPRL, whatever, yeah. Because if it's Perl 5 or Perl 6, there's, there's more one to, way to do it. And this is basically my idea. Yes, we can. And I will continue to work on that, and I hope you will too. And I think that's how we can actually reappropriate the Perl brand in the future by all working on it together and basically not get dist distracted by trolls that say it's not good. And this concludes my presentation for today. <laughs> Any questions? <coughs> oh dear. Well, uh, I, I started on a guide, uh, and um, it, it is actually in my in one of my repos, and I could uh, have some help. So I, I'll I'll uh, I'll put a link to that in in the in the uh, description of the talk on the, on the X site. Also, a list of high value modules. That would be particularly well. <laughs> High value modules, the, that, the, 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 beauty, uh, the beauty of the modules in eye of the beholder, right? Um, I, anything which supports the tool chain and uh, anything which supports the chain of DBX class would be high value. That would be high value, definitely, yeah. So DBI is definitely high value. Um, but the DBI is a, a whole s a different story by itself because uh, Tim Bunce, for the past 10 years, I said, I don't want to re-implement DBI because it has some fundamental Impl design flaws. Impl6. Impl6, sorry, re-implement Impl6. I don't want to do DBI uh, re-implement re in Impl6. At this point in time, I'm, I'm more about, we need to be able to do DBI without too many changes in Impl6 and just do that. And, and okay, we'll see what other uh, ways we can do actually to, uh, make database access <laughs> more transparent. So I, I, at the moment, I would favor just doing a port of DBI. In the, in the recent years, I saw you program quite a lot for Pro 6, and you used a lot of uh, MQP in your yeah. extensions. Yeah, in, in, the, in the core, yeah. yeah. Are you going to remove that already? I hope at one point. You see. Well, the, the, the thing is, if you, um, actually Zofix did a, a, an experiment the other day uh, about uh, an algorithm that somebody uh, complained to that was about that the Pro 6 was very slow, and he actually implemented a pure NQP version of that. Um, the pure NQP version was two to three times faster than the Pro 5 version. That's the reason I'm writing stuff in, in NQP in the core internals, because we need that speed now. Uh, the idea is that in the future, the optimization will become so good that actually the, what we do manually in NQP is done automatically by the, the, by the, uh, the, the runtime, so you, you don't have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's for me is the reason to currently use NQP, NQP. I would not recommend doing that in, in modules out there because we want to have pure Perl, because in a sense, using NQP is almost as bad as XS. Except almost, because it does have a, 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 an interface rather than just letting you loose in all the bytes and bits that you have in, in your processor. But um, yeah, it is something that you, you should use with care. Yeah, it would be nice to have the two versions around. One is the, the NQP version and one is the Pure Perl 6. Yeah, but and we don't... Them. Well, that, that is one of the things that, that we actually do in a few places where we actually try to find out how the optimizations are going. So, Okay, and that I would also say Jonathan has uh, two nice talks coming up. 
One about uh, op the optimizations that uh, Morvium is doing, and the other one was about eight ways of doing async uh, programming. Yeah, async and parallel programming. Uh, please go see those. Anything else? Okay. No. What are the places we should uh, talk uh, about? Places, places you visit. <coughs> well, I mean, if you only visit, uh, well, I, do you visit Pearl Monks? Okay. Yeah. Well, Pearl Monks is not known for its friendliness towards Pearl Six. Well, if somebody asks asks ask a question that could have an answer in Pearl Six, you could say that. Maybe you can do this in Pearl Six, and it would be better or not. I would. Be, I wouldn't go about. Uh, I don't want everybody to go about being a, a complete uh, um, mad uh, religious fanatic. <laughs> but point out that there are alternatives. Is what I would say. It's what, what I try to do. Frostcon, exactly. And you uh, meet a lot of people who say, oh, Pearl, that's bad. And so, have you seen uh, Modern Pearl? What is Modern Pearl? And, uh, yeah. and take it from there, yeah. Uh, like Larry is doing at, at to today, he's giving a talk in Krakow to the IT day there for the university or something. And uh, that's definitely not a Pearl crowd. As far as I know, so stuff like that. Okay, um, do we have enough time for Wendy still? Mm, yes, of course. Yep. Thank you.